Hello gardeners and welcome to another edition of your gardening week on this last day of summer 2020 autumn comes tomorrow which brings a lot of changes to our gardening season we'll be talking a lot about that over the next 90 minutes in addition to answering your questions throwing out some gardener scott gardening philosophy and just participating in a wonderful online gardening community it's great to see everybody today Everyone's checking in from all over the world, from British Columbia to Indonesia already. I think that's just amazing, incredible. Let's get right to a couple questions that have already been asked. I appreciate you, Jay, for popping in, answering a couple questions, and I will completely agree with what you said. We had a question from Rachel. Um, first off, she pointed out that she was... Uh, waking up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 degrees Celsius. And I think that's a really important number when it comes to gardening. In the spring, we want our evening temperatures to be above 50 degrees or 10 Celsius when it comes to putting our peppers in the ground and putting our tomatoes in the ground. Well, in the fall, when the nighttime temperatures start dropping below that temperature, you're going to start seeing decreased production in tomatoes and peppers and things are really going to slow down. Now her question was about the Bocking 14 Comfrey and how to prepare it for winter in a pot. And this holds true to a lot of the plants that you might be growing in pots and that you want to prepare for winter. Think about the plant. There are a lot of plants that can handle cold conditions, Comfrey being one of them. So if you have plants in pots that you want to continue growing in pots and they are in small pots, I'll often dig a trench in my garden and just put the whole pot in the trench and then put soil around it. And that'll help keep the temperature within the pot pretty moderated through the course of the summer. The, the plant can handle it without too many issues. If you leave pots just sitting out in the open, you do run the risk, even in relatively mild winters, of those roots maybe drying out, desiccating, maybe freezing to the point that it'll kill them. So often pots need a little bit extra protection, which is why I'll consider burying them. Or you can move them inside to a shed or a container where the temperatures are also a little more moderated. But do think about the watering, even in winter, potted plants will often need water because those pots are going to grow dry out faster in the sun the soil will dry out again you don't want the plants desiccating so a couple ideas for preparing your your pots for winter and how you might want to proceed into the winter um, Raymond says nice background I've changed it today and I'm anticipating on doing different backgrounds to match the different times of year. That's what I'll, I'll pretty much everybody suggested last week when I asked that question. So thanks for that. I appreciate that thumbs up. Good morning to you, Jennifer, as well. Laura's also saying from Arvada, Colorado, love the background. Um, I like I like the green. I like the summer, even though these gourds that are behind me, these were... Um, some birdhouse gourds that are, were in my garden this year, but of course they got zapped by the cold and they don't look like this right now, but it's a nice reminder of what a garden can look like in summer. So let's get to another question. Um, Eva was asking about green tomatoes, and this was one of the answers that Jay gave, and I completely agree. If you have any type of fruit on your plants right now, be it a squash, a tomato, a pepper, any of those type of plants that you're waiting for them to ripen before harvest and you suspect that freezing or frosty weather is coming, leave the fruit on the plant for as long as possible, right up to the day before that frost. Tomatoes are great. Yes, they'll ripen indoors on a counter, but they'll ripen better outside on the plant. Now, if the nights are getting down colder than that 50 degree point and the days start getting to those cooler temperatures you can go ahead and harvest a little bit early before the freeze because they will prefer a warmer temperature to ripen so inside at your 70 degree indoor temperature that's about 21 celsius 
those tomatoes will ripen pretty well. They won't ripen real well if they're being exposed to cold temperatures heading into a freeze. But by all means, leave them on as long as possible. And then we had another question about um, the yogurt cups. Raymond's concerned about plastic leaching harmful chemicals when exposed to the sun. Well, I've talked in a few of my videos about reusing containers like yogurt cups when I start my seeds or when I make that first transplanting into a small pot with my seedlings indoors. I'm not using yogurt containers outside. And while yogurt containers are food safe, and I have absolutely no concern about them leaching harmful chemicals, and this is what Jay also had answered, I am more concerned about some of those thinner plastics outside just breaking down in the sun and the wind. They'll start cracking because they're not made to be outdoors. So a lot of those kind of reused containers, I strictly use indoors. When it comes to nursery pots, you know, those big black plastic pots, I reuse those all the time outside in the sun, and I'm not concerned at all about harmful leaching. Now, if you have a concern about chemicals in plastic, you can actually do some searches. Those little numbers that are inside triangles that they put on all plastic containers, that tells what the different chemicals are and what the plastics are best used for. And so you can actually do a search based on that number <clears throat> and it'll tell you if it's suitable for an outside application, a food application, all those kind of things. So thank you for those questions and thank you, Jay, for answering. And I'll point out right now, this is a great community for questions. So as you ask your questions today, I'm going to try to get to as many as I can, but I can't cover everything. But there are a lot of knowledgeable gardeners in this chat, like Jay Dixon and Heidi, I saw checking in as well. If you see people giving an answer to a question, particularly if it's Jay or Heidi, you're, getting, you're going to get a lot of good, helpful information from the chat on this channel. So ask your question. Hopefully I'll get to it. But there's lots of other knowledgeable gardeners that are following along that can answer your question as well. So let's get right into it. Um, Sharon C., thanks. You're responding to Linda saying, I tell my husband all the time, according to Gardener Scott. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I'm here to give the information and I, I'm also trying to share my philosophies. So feel free to garden like Gardener Scott. Thanks so much. <coughs> Riverdale Gardeners, good to see you today. So glad to see everyone checking in. Linda's asking, what are your thoughts about growing potatoes in 10-gallon pots? Great idea, especially with your question about harvesting. Growing potatoes in pots is extremely easy. And when it comes time to harvest, you basically just dump out the pot and the potatoes are right there ready to go. So I think it's extremely easy easy. The, the concern is about how many potatoes, seed potatoes, you can put in each container. So in a five gallon container, you might only want to put one seed potato and grow one plant. In a 10 gallon container, you could easily grow two, maybe even three, depending on the size of the potatoes that you want. So uh, vary the amount of seed potatoes by the container. Uh, Good buddy of mine was, has been on a few of these chats in recent weeks, Tony from Simplify Gardening. It's a UK channel. He is an expert on growing potatoes and he grows exclusively in pots. So he recently had a harvest, potato harvest, hundreds of pounds of potatoes, all grown in pots. Uh, if you want to know more about potatoes, I'm not a big potato gardener, I'd say go to Tony on Simplify Gardening because He's just incredible with the number of potatoes that he can grow. Okay, Tom Etz is saying, good morning. Now that my fall vegetables have sprouted and are growing to apply fertilizer, do I just spread it between the plant on top of the mulch? Um, depends on the fertilizer, but most of the time, yeah, just spread it on top of the soil. If it's a liquid fertilizer, definitely just put it on top around the plant near the roots. 
There are some fertilizers like the Osmocote that I like to use, which is um, an inorganic fertilizer. It needs to break down in the soil and it's best if you mix it into the top few inches of soil. So in that case, if you're using one of those type of pelleted fertilizers, for instance, move away the mulch, put in those little granular pieces of fertilizer, work them into the top few inches of soil, and then put the mulch right back on top. David, good to see you in northern Utah today. Rose is here from Arizona. We have Tina checking in from the high desert. This is so great. All of us are gardeners. doesn't matter where we're calling for or viewing from. We're all in the same boat. And it's fall tomorrow. This is one of those times of year. If you saw my video last night, I think this is a really a good time of year for you to start thinking about next year. Now, granted, the season is not over for most of us. We still have a lot of time to grow plants, but the season is waning. And so while it's still warm outside, get outside and start thinking about what happened in the summer, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to change, what you want to add, and then start making note of that. Put it in your garden journal, put it down on paper, make a spreadsheet so you can have some ideas for next year. And then you start looking at the sun and the weather and the insects and all those other factors in gardening. This is a great time of year to do it. And because especially for you new gardeners, if this is your first year, how do you garden? Where do you walk? Where do you drag your hose? How far away from the house are you? And as you look at expanding your garden, because I'm assuming you're going to want to do more of it, well, this is the time of year to start analyzing how you gardened this year to determine how you're going to garden next year and do all of that planning right now. Now, this is more of a garden planning idea, and I talk about that in the video from last night. The specific plants, you've got plenty of time to determine the plants and exactly how you're going to place them. Those are really good winter projects. But as far as building and planting, uh, planning and expanding, fall's a great time to do that. So I always look forward to this time of year because there's just so much you can do. And I had a question, um, <clears throat> let's see, who was it from? Was asking about um, uh, a fall crop. Kathleen had asked the question a little while ago, is it too late to plant a fall crop? Depends on where you are. But in most cases, for most of us, I don't think it's too late. I still have seeds I haven't started yet that I'm going to be doing outside because I have protection planned. I have the hoops. I have the plastic. I have the cold frames. I have those things in place or coming. And so it's not too late at all. So look at your own season. This is another great fall activity. How much time do you have? Learn when your first frost date is and that will be a big determination of putting in a fall crop and I, I have a few videos that I did last month that talk about that Carla good to see you again I always say that every week it's so nice you make my week with your super chat every Monday morning for me so thank you so much Carla Don Bruce is saying Gardner Scott zone 5 checking in loved your raised bed planning video thanks Don I appreciate that Another question, Gardner Scott, what causes tomato blossoms to dry and fall off without setting fruit and how to treat it? Great question. <clears throat> I've answered this in previous videos. Much of it comes down to heat. And so in the really hot days of summer, when the temperatures get above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 30 degrees, 32 degrees Celsius, when the temperature starts getting above that temperature on a regular basis the pollination is not going to happen and the, fl the flowers on tomatoes are just going to fall off uh, you also have the reverse problem when it starts getting too cool like the nighttime temperatures dropping below 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius the, you're gonna see some flower drop so that's the most likely reason is it's it's too hot or it's too cool. 
there isn't a lot you can do now as far as the coolness the cool temperatures you can cover your plants cover them with plastic going into the evening and you might have better success with the flower staying on and and even pollinating so that's one corrective action in the fall during the summer you can try shading your plants during the day that can help keep those blossoms on as well also really dry windy conditions i have this problem in my garden it's so dry it's so windy that'll also cause the blossoms to drop off so in most cases blossom drop is caused by weather there isn't a whole lot you can do about it but you might be able to moderate its impact on your plants okay let's see what we have jay dixon thank you so much and heidi as well thanks for answering questions staying so active in the chat i appreciate it so much gladys good to see you again good morning master scott and everyone from west virginia i'm a little late checking my fruit trees so i can see how i'm going to prune them good for you um, i've been checking my fruit trees lately as well i'm not going to be pruning them until the january february time frame but this is a again things to do in fall look at your trees and start thinking about the shape and the pruning so especially for fruit trees you can get better production by pruning your trees and pruning them into specific shapes for the different types of plants and i talk about this in an earlier video i had where i was putting in my fruit trees i'll do another video in january or february when i actually prune my fruit trees but now's a good time to be out in the garden looking at your trees to figure out how you're going to prune them and what kind of action you're going to take because in winter when most of the fruit tree pruning takes place there's no leaves on the trees you can get a pretty good feel for the structure of the tree but it's this time of year when the trees have their leaves you can get a better feel for what the shape is going to look like once the leaves come out so glad you could join us Gladys and uh, I know you'll be getting back into the garden MMM70 Gardener Scott do you recommend planting garlic a little deeper for warmer climates I'm in 9b Central Florida great question and garlic is actually on my list of things to talk about today so let's get to that so yes and no so garlic can be planted a little bit deeper and in warmer regions yes I would encourage that you plant the garlic a little bit deeper of more concern for you is the variety that you choose to grow because most garlic requires a very cold winter for the clove to develop into a bulb so in 9b that's getting right to the edge of even being able to grow garlic so take special note on what type of variety that you're planning to grow I would suggest a Creole variety they tend to do well in warm and hot um, areas warm being the winter conditions soft neck varieties almost definitely you're going to have to grow and I have videos where I talk about this but the big difference in garlic is whether it's a soft neck or a hard neck soft neck varieties tend to do better in areas with warmer winters hard neck varieties tend to do better in regions with colder winters that's a big factor the warmth of the soil makes a difference and so in an area like florida uh yeah i might suggest planting a little bit deeper definitely mulch because the mulch will help keep your soil cooler in those warm winter days so a little bit deeper a thick layer of mulch in a warm winter area that can probably help your garlic in those cold winter areas i also encourage a heavy mulch to try to help avoid the freeze thaw cycle that we often get in winter that's when the cold the soil is really cold at night and then we have hot sunny conditions during the day so the ground starts to thaw then it freezes then it thaws and that can actually push the cloves out of the ground so mulching garlic in cold winter areas can help reduce that cold thaw cycle as well 
But right now is the time to start thinking about your garlic. For those of you that are in zone um, four with a shorter growing season, now is probably the time to be planting. In my zone 5B garden, my season still has a few more weeks to go, even though I had that devastating freeze a couple weeks back. But I've got another week or two before I'm going to plant my garlic. Most of us are going to be planting in October. In an area like Florida, you should probably wait more into November or early December. You've got to get those cool conditions for the cloves to get established. Start thinking about varieties. Now, I have a video coming out on Friday. It was a lot of fun to make. I tasted eight of the different varieties that I grew this last year. And along with some of my family, we tell you which ones we liked best. If you haven't ordered your garlic yet, you need to do it very soon. And the video on Friday, it might give you some ideas. If you've already ordered garlic, you may see one of the ones that you're planning to grow that we tasted. So I've got that video coming out on Friday. But definitely be thinking about your garlic right now. Think about getting it ordered. Our, our local nursery, our nearest nursery that I like to shop at actually has about 15 different varieties this year. That's more than they normally have. They have a pretty good stock, but they're already starting to sell out. So think about that. Think about your region. Think about whether it's going to be soft neck or hard neck and get to it because the time is coming to put the garlic in the ground. Okay, let's see who, what else we've got popping up. Um, Canix Ray Yu is saying, doing new raised beds on what is now lawn just first and only time till it up or just cover with cardboard cover with cardboard in beds and also pathway areas great question i'm actually doing that right now myself i talk a little bit about it i've got a video if you haven't seen it i did it a couple weeks about go about why i don't have a lawn and i start showing or i show how i'm starting to reclaim that lawn area into a garden space and that's what i'm doing is i'm using cardboard you can till it up. I'm not a huge fan of tilling in most situations because tilling can really break apart any soil structure you might have. And it can kill a lot of the soil organisms that are already in place. And those soil organisms are what you're going to need to break down all of that grass and lawn material. But if you put cardboard on top of it, now all of that former lawn will just begin to decompose. The guard cardboard will eventually decompose as well. If you put some soil and or mulch on top of the cardboard, then you've got a great future area for planting. So that's what I'm doing. I'm doing cardboard with no tilling. If you have a tiller and you like to till and you want to amend the soil now, go ahead and put a lot of compost on top of the grass till it in get it worked in really well i would suggest also putting cardboard in place because the cardboard will help keep the grass from regrowing and then you could put a mulch on top of it as for the pathways i have one of my big beds in ground beds where i <clears throat> i use cardboard in the middle of the bed as a path and then i have mulch on top of that cardboard but in all the rest of my paths in the garden, and this is what I've been doing this last week, um, if you see my videos, you see the trailer load of wood chips in the background. Well, that's a different load of wood chips for just about every video because I'm continuing to get more and more wood chips. And this week was the last week for picking up the free wood chips at my local um, mulching source. Um, but that's what I've been doing this week is putting wood chips in my pathways without cardboard. And those wood chips by themselves are usually enough to, to kill the weeds in place, at least reduce them dramatically, and then also protect the soil going into the winter and help keep weeds in the future from popping up. <clears throat> okay. Um, have a question about what causes powdery mildew on the chili plant leaves and how to treat it. Um, powdery mildew is caused primarily by the weather. Again, 
It's one of those issues more with dry weather. We think of mildew as being a humid, wet weather type of problem, but powdery mildew most often happens in drier conditions. And the way to deal with it is to try to improve the air circulation on your plants to start to keep your soil and your mulch moist. That'll actually help reduce some of the powdery mildew problems. Once you have it, you can cut off those leaves if it's a problem, and especially if you need to prune to increase air circulation. You can put copper-based products because it is a fungus. You've had, you can use uh, diluted milk. I talked about this last week, and that can help. You can use baking soda, an alkaline material that can also help with that fungus. So there's a lot of those type of treatments. For the most part, I just live with it. I'll cut off the, the leaves that are really looking bad just to improve air circulation. But it's so common, it's, it's almost impossible to prevent it. It's just a matter of living with it or dealing with it when it happens to come. Okay, um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention something that Frank Alselmo had mentioned early on when he first checked in. Um, he's a local gardener, contacted me. We've been communicating a little bit back and forth. And he's part of a group that gets a community together to rake up leaves. And so I'm hoping that I can actually join up with them, get some bagged leaves, help with the raking. And this is uh, an idea I want to throw out to you. You might have something like this in your community as well, where you might be able to volunteer to clean up parks or to clean up um, neighborhoods where you've got a lot of fallen leaves, individual neighbors who need their yards raked. Look for this kind of thing. This is another fall activity as the leaves begin to, to fall from the trees. It's great on a number of levels. First off, if you can volunteer and help out your community, that's a great thing for you to do. If you can help other people get their leaves when they don't want those leaves, that's awesome. But as a gardener, this is a great opportunity to actually get leaves for your garden. And that's one reason that Frank reached out to me and that I'm willing to participate because I'm anticipating after a day of raking leaves with a lot of other interested community people of taking a lot of those bags of leaves home. <clears throat> bagged leaves are awesome for you to have a supply of through the winter, even into spring. I try to get as many bags of leaves as possible every single autumn. I'll use many of them in my garden as a mulch right away. But I also like to have leaves in place going into spring and even in summer. And I still have about a half a bag of leaves from last year that I haven't used yet. And so in my videos about mulching and soil improvement, if I show putting leaves on the ground, or if I talk about using leaves, almost always it's from bagged leaves that I got the year before. So this is another aspect of planning your garden in fall. Plan your mulching for the next year, which means you probably need to find some leaves and Put them in your garden to be used, put them in your shed, put them in your garage, find a place to store them, but definitely get the bagged leaves. As you're driving or walking through your neighborhood, if you see neighbors that have bagged leaves sitting out on the curb, take those bagged leaves for your garden. Now, I try to be a nice neighbor and I'll knock on the door and ask if it's okay to take the bag leaves. But if they're just going to be sent to the landfill, if the dump tr or the garbage truck is just going to come and pick up those bags, why not use them in your garden setting? Because leaves are an incredible mulch. They're great for the soil. They're great for earthworms and all of the microorganisms. It really helps create a balanced soil in addition to compost and a lot of the other things that we use. So Get your bag of leaves, see if there's an organization you can work with to get those leaves and help out other people along the way. Win-win 
all the way around. So just wanted to give a shout out to Frank because I uh, hope to actually do a video about that if we can make it happen. Okay, Quanto R is saying, Gardner Scott, what do you think of manure? I, I think manures are great. Pretty much all manures. Uh, chicken manure, worm manure, horse manure, cow manure, alpaca manure. If it's an animal that is eating plants, it's good. Now, you, you don't hear people refer to dog manure and cat manure because cats and dogs have a diet that is usually based with a lot of meat byproducts and fats. That's not as good to be using in your garden. There's a lot of other reasons. But plant-based diets for animals and then they poop it out? Yes. Use those manures in your garden. I always advise to find out the source of the manure because if that particular animal is eating plants that have been uh, sprayed with herbicides, that herbicide could go through the animal into the manure and it could adversely affect your garden. If the animal is uh, licking salt as part of their diet or salt is being added to their diet, that goes through the manure into your garden and potentially that salt could damage your plants. So I'm a huge advocate of manures, but you should be forewarned. You need to find out about the source because not all manures are equal. But organic fertilizers, no herbicides, no salt, age them so you have no concern about E. coli or any other pathogens. Age them for at least six months before you put them in the garden. I, I think composting is the best way to use manure, but by all means, yeah, love manures. Greg Kill says, Gardener Scott, I currently have wood chips on my raised beds. Should I remove the wood chips and then add my fallen leaves and replace wood chips on top? Good question. Um, so you have to think about the, the breakdown of these materials. If you put the leaves on top, there aren't any soil organisms that are in contact with those leaves. So those leaves will eventually break down due to wind and rain. They'll filter down between the wood chips and they'll find, the, they'll find their way to the soil if they don't blow away first. The leaves will break down faster than the wood chips. So yes, pull the wood chips aside, put the leaves down, and then put the wood chips back over it. That's a much better way to get those leaves breaking down and improving the soil much faster than the wood chips alone. Great question. Linda Hardwick, thank you for that super chat. I'm so glad you share your love of gardening with all of us. You are truly appreciated. Thank you, Linda. That, that means a lot. I appreciate that. And thank you for that super chat. Okay, Laura's last be saying, Gardener Scott, I saw your video on espalier fruit trees. Can I do that to an old tree bought at a garden center? <clears throat> Maybe. So espalier is an art form, essentially, but it's pruning. It's just how you prune a tree. And you can prune a tree into a shape, and that's the basic concept behind espalier. It's even more basic than that because it started in Europe and it's two-dimensional growing of a fruit tree, typically. So the tree is growing up against a fence, it's growing up against a wall, and then you prune off all of the branches on the side that would be growing into the wall. And you also prune off all the branches that would be growing forward into the path or where you stand. So all of the branches are growing sideways in a shape that you determine. When it comes to older trees, it depends on how old the tree is. It depends on the type of tree. So apples, pears are ideally suited for espalier pruning because of how, how they send up, how they send up the spars. And spars are very short branches. Those are the fruiting branches where the fruit appears. Older trees might not have the fruiting spars anymore, or those spars may have been pruned off 
uh, previously. So that could be a limitation with espalier pruning an older tree. But as far as basic shaping, and if you want a two-dimensional pruning of older trees, you can definitely do it. One of the nice things about espalier early with a fruit tree is that the branches are still pliable. You can bend them into the shape that you want. It's not as easy with older trees where the branches are already woody and they've reached essentially a permanent shape. But with younger branches, you can get away with forming. And if the older branches don't have the shape you want, you just kind of have to accept it. But you can still prune off the front and the back if it's growing in an area where you want to get that particular shape. So much more difficult. I would suggest you watch a lot more videos than mine when it comes to pruning older trees to an, to espalier. So it really depends on how old the tree is. I'll have another video coming out again in the January, February timeframe to show how I prune my trees that I have for espalier in my garden right now. So more of that is coming. PD is saying that Gardner Scott, Master Gardner Scott, some instructions for seed suggest that you sow a few seeds together and then separate them. Why is this advantageous? Um, it depends on the seed. <clears throat> there, are, I'm, I'm not sure which ones you might be suggesting. Often you'll have the seeds, or it'll be suggested that you um, grow multiple seeds in a space and then separate them just because they're so easy to separate. I do this with tomatoes. I'll, I'll put two or three, maybe even four tomato seeds in a single cell in a plant tray. You know, one of those one, by, one inch by one inch cells and then separate them from there. So it really, I think one, a big reason for doing that is you can start more seeds in a smaller space and then you can separate them out and choose the seedlings that are the strongest to repot. That's typically why I think a lot of the seed packages say you can do multiple seeds. There are some seeds that really have a, a, a symbiotic relationship with another type of plant, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. And in those cases, the seed needs to be next to a different type of plant often to germinate but those tend to be um, native plants and they're very regional we have one plant that i love indian paintbrush but it's like it's that way it has to be near other specific types of plants for it to grow but typically i think the seed packets say that just so you can get more seeds started in a smaller space and then the seedlings will be hardy enough to separate carolyn medina thank you for that super chat I appreciate that uh, as well. It's always nice to have a contribution. Thanks. Um, River Song, thank you for your all caps, love, background, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. Thanks. There'll be a different one next week. And so um, I do want to point out an idea that Jennifer Segrist suggested last week. And I see that you've got a question just above that or a statement where it says your trees may be going to sleep soon. I would feed them in early spring when they wake up. Um, good point. I think you're probably answering the question. But yes, fertilizing in spring tends to be better. But Jennifer suggested last week that I put backgrounds from your garden. So right now, this week and last week, it's been my garden. Next week, I'll probably do another picture from my garden. But if you would like your background, or if you would like my background to be your garden, go ahead and send me a photo. You can go ahead and send me an email to gardenerscott at gardenerscott.com. Attach the photo. And periodically, I'll go ahead and use some of your photos as my background. Now, I do need you to give me permission to do that. So in the email, go ahead and give me your name and explicitly say that you are giving me permission to use your photo in my videos, just so we have no concern about copyright uh, because you will still own your photograph 
I'll just be using it, but I'll need permission from you to use it. But also share a story. So if you take a picture of your garden and there's some story behind it, by all means, share that as well. If I use it as a background for one of these Monday live chats, I'll share the story as well, and you'll be in the background and highlighted for the week. So thank you, Jennifer, for that suggestion last week. I think it was a great idea. And so moving forward, would love to see some of your garden photos that you'd like to see as a background on my Monday live stream. So send it to Gardner Scott, one word, at gardnerscott.com. Rod Mula, thanks for being you. I say that back to you. Thanks for being you as well. Thanks so much for that contribution. That's incredible. I appreciate that. Um, Rod was the first one on the live stream today saying hello and uh, came on quite early. I was on early as well, getting the photo set up for the background, among other things. So thanks so much for that, Rod. I appreciate it. AJ, glad you made it. Glad you're here. Uh, thumbs up hearts from Jennifer it was your suggestion I want to give you credit for it <clears throat> okay Emma is saying thanks to gardening work it feels like this year is almost over we have beautiful yard and bountiful harvest so glad to hear that uh, the season is winding down there's no doubt about that but there's always something that you can do especially again for new gardeners I encourage you to not think about this as an end to the gardening season. Those of us that have been gardening for a while know that we think about gardening pretty much every day of the year. If we're out in the garden, of course, there's all those gardening things that we got to do. If we're not out in the garden, we're thinking about going out in the garden. If the weather is so bad we can't even go outside, we're thinking about what we are going to do when we can go outside into the garden. So from this point, the beginning of fall to the beginning of spring, it's six months of who knows what, card, what kind of gardening activity we'll have, but it's six months to think about gardening, to plan, to choose the seeds, to share ideas, to talk to other gardeners, all that kind of stuff. So while the plants might be fading, really hope that your gardening interest isn't fading and in, in fact this is a wonderful time for your interest to actually be peaked to increase to really start think about that next year and what you can do to make it even better than this one so all of us who have had some beneficial harvest most of my harvest didn't turn out the way that I had hoped but the harvest that I did get I think all of you would agree it just tastes so much better and it's just so much more enjoyable when we get those kind of situations that we can um, enjoy ourselves but also share. I, I think that's one reason why I enjoyed the video that's coming out on Friday about garlic as well is I was able to share my garlic with my family doing a tasting that none of us had ever done before and it was a lot of fun. So I hope you check out that video on Friday. It, it really is enjoyable. Laura says, that's a great idea. My garden isn't really presentable right now, but I'll love to share once it's closer to my vision. You've helped me a lot in creating that vision. Thanks so much, Laura. I've actually spent a lot of time in the last couple days just looking out the window, standing in the garden, sitting in the garden, thinking about the vision. My plan is basically a five-year plan plan for my garden and this is just the first year so I am constantly thinking to next year and the year after that and the year after that and the year after that and being in my garden looking around and trying to improve upon that vision the vision is there it's going to be amazing but to improve upon the envision envisionment of the garden Years ahead of time, I find that incredibly enjoyable. And when I say I look out the window, I think a garden should be viewed from many different perspectives. So my front yard, for instance, I put plants in place so that as people walk by or they drive by and they look at my yard, they look at it and go, wow, that's a beautiful yard. And it brightens their day a little bit. Well, I want that same feeling as well. So 
I also plan my landscape so that when I look out the window, I have an incredible view to brighten my own day. So as you move over these next six months of planning and creating that vision, do it for yourself, definitely. But I think so many of us are creating landscapes and creating gardens so they look good to others. By all means, that's important. But see the different perspectives. Design your garden space so that it looks different from different places in your yard. And from each of those places, it looks fantastic. It's challenging. It does take a little bit of extra work in design. There's a lot of lessons to be learned. There will be mistakes along the way, but I don't think of it as a mistake. I just think of it as an opportunity to learn and do things a little bit different. So there's another little bit thrown at you. Jennifer says, thank you on the advice for pruning fig trees earlier in the year. You're welcome. I appreciate that. Linda says, I look forward to the next five years. Absolutely. I'm hoping to have this entire process <coughs> documented so, so that a new gardener, and especially all of you who are following along, can see how I took a bare plot of land and over the course of five years turned it into a beautiful garden space. So I'm trying to give you a template to follow. I'm not saying do it the way I do it. I'm just saying this is what I've done and it helps give a lot of gardeners some ideas. But that's one reason why I'm making all these videos so that I can have a video record of how you can take a vision and then make it happen. Ah, just so incredible. Um, Team Pumpkin. Hey, Gardener Scott, remember me with a smile. Of course, I don't remember everybody, but I with a name like T Pumpkin, it's it's easy to remember you from popping up before. Thanks for being here today. Um, Luz is saying, Gardener Scott, according to what I'm reading, I should be planting a bunch of veggies, but it's still over 95 degrees and will be for a couple more months. Thoughts? <coughs> so Luz is gardening in a region completely different from a lot of us, a desert environment where it's a lot hotter during the summer and most of the planting actually takes place in the fall because the temperatures finally get to the point where you can start growing. So this is a, an, an issue for all of us, be it lose in the fall planting a winter garden or those of us that are thinking about growing in spring. Much of it depends on the soil temperature and then the outside air temperature at night. The daytime temperatures when it's hot are a factor, but they will be cooling. And so Luz, that might be a little hot right now for you to get germination on a lot of the things that you might be growing. You can go ahead and probably start consider doing some shading of the area that you're going to be starting your seeds or your plants in. I would take a soil temperature reading. And if it's if the soil temperature is above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 27 degrees Celsius, I would delay a little bit. Uh, there are few seeds that will germinate well when the soil temperature is above 80. Uh, they really prefer to have a soil temperature closer to 70 degrees, about 21 Celsius. That tends to be a sweet spot for most of what we're growing in our garden. So you might want to delay a little bit, but with winter growing, one of the biggest concerns is the lack of sunlight. As we move into November and December in the Northern Hemisphere, we're getting less sun. So if you delay too much longer, you're going to have a period of time where you're not going to get a lot of growth on your plants. Elliot Coleman, who does four season gardening, calls it the Persephone period. It's a period of time where you're not getting the six full hours of sunlight in your garden. And that typically runs for many of us from like mid-November to the end of February, typically. So it, it's a difficult situation to lose. I know you're in a hard region. I would go ahead and start some stuff now, maybe de <clears throat> delay by a few weeks some of the rest, get what you can now and when the, the sun falls in the sky and you're not getting a lot of light, expect that the plants are probably going to slow down quite a bit. 
Musafir Creative Studio, Gardner Scott, why are there maggots in my compost? Because there is food in your compost for the maggots. Uh, flies are everywhere. We all have flies all around us. And flies will lay their eggs in an area where there's food. <coughs> your compost pile probably has a lot of vegetables in it. And that's why they're eating it. Don't be too concerned. When we create our compost, we want that compost to be broken down so that we can use it in our soil. Maggots are just another uh, insect that helps break down our piles. It's not unusual to see beetles in a pile. It's, it's definitely not unusual to see earthworms. All of those organisms are helping to break down the organic material in our piles. And so the larva will be eating some of that material. And then the bacteria within the compost pile will feed upon the excrement of the, the, um, the larva. And some of those larvae are going to die. And they'll actually become food for the organisms within your compost pile as well. So uh, the reason they're there is because there's food to eat. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. If it concerns you and you don't like seeing the maggots in your pile... Go ahead and flip your pile, get it turning, get the temperature higher, because that's another reason. If the temperature isn't high enough, you're going to see more of that insect and animal activity. But by keeping your pile moist, by turning it, by having a really good nitrogen and carbon mix, you can really boost the temperatures. And when the temperatures start getting high, the maggots aren't going to be able to live. They're going to die. So... Uh, your pile is definitely too cool. That's not a bad thing. I have cool compost piles. But if you want to get rid of them, increase the temperature by aerating, adding moisture, and making sure you've got enough nitrogen in your your um, soil. Okay, Guanto's asking, Gardner Scott, have you used neem oil? Oh, yeah. yeah I, I use neem oil all the time. I, I use neem oil more often indoors. I think there are more effective ways of dealing with um, pests outdoors. And so I don't use neem oil a lot outside, but um, I use it inside a lot. <clears throat> and Stephen Luna is asking, do roaches do the same? Um, yes and no. Yeah. Um, roach, if you find roaches in your pile, they're eating the, the food you have in your pile. So absolutely, they will help break down the pile. Um, I'd much rather have the roaches outside in my pile than inside in my house. But yes, effectively, that's what the roaches are doing. Roaches might also be using your compost pile as a home more than just strictly being there to eat. So there's a couple reasons why the roaches might be there. Um, I want to talk about a couple other things um, this week before we run out of time. Um, this is also a time of year to be collecting seeds and if you haven't collected seeds, you should probably think about it. If you have plants in your garden right now uh, with fruit on them or flowers on them, consider leaving those in place so you can collect the seed. The thing I wanted to talk about, because I, I see confusion about this all the time, and these are some of the most common questions I get. It's about hybrid seeds. So if you are growing a plant right now and it is a hybrid plant. The, we, the way you'll know that is with the seed packet. The seed packet should say that it's a hybrid. The plant tag should say it's a hybrid if you bought it as a plant. Doesn't always happen, but it should. If you save the seed from hybrid plants, you can put that seed into the soil next year and grow a plant. But do not expect that it's going to be the same plant that you collected the seed from. A hybrid is a mix from two different parents of two different types of plants. And so a hybrid seed that you save, or I should say the seed from a hybrid plant that you save will have mixed up genetics. And when a new plant grows, there's no telling what plant will result. So, I'm not saying don't do it because it can be fun to discover new plants. You, you will be the first person to, to have ever grown that plant when you put a hybrid seed in the ground from something that you've collected. Just don't expect 
that it's going to bear true. If you want to keep growing the same type of plant year after year and save the seed of that plant, you need to have an open pollinated plant. Heirloom plants are the best way for you to know that it's an open pollinated plant. All heirloom plants are open pollinated. All open up pollinated plants are not necessarily heirloom, but the seed packet might not tell you that it's open pollinated. So it's one of those, a little bit of a gamble if you're gonna save those seed, being unsure if it's a hybrid or open pollinated, but heirlooms, definitely open pollinated. So if you grew some heirloom varieties of plants this year, consider saving those seeds moving forward, and you should expect that the plant that results from those seeds will be just like the parent from where you got the seeds. Okay, um, let's see what else we have popping up here. Um, MH is saying cuttings of hybrid plants are exact replicas though. Yes, definitely. And this holds true with um, pretty much any plant. If you're taking a cutting from a plant, and then you are growing a new plant from that cutting, it is a clone. It is that exact plant. So it, it's a replica. You don't have to worry about there being an issue. So if you have a hybrid that you want to propagate, a cutting is definitely a way to get the same plant. You don't have to um, go through the process of collecting seeds that you don't know what is going to result. So yes, thank you for pointing that out because you're exactly right. Um, tomatoes, for instance. Um, if you have a hybrid tomato and you want to grow more of that tomato, you can just take the branches of the tomato plant, put them into some good soil, keep the soil moist, and you can expect a new tomato plant to grow from that cutting, that branch off of a tomato plant. Now, it's not a leaf branch. It needs to be like a sucker with a growing tip, but um, that's, that's a good way to continue growing tomatoes, for instance, from a hybrid year after year. Now, you can't have it outside where it's gonna be frozen, but I haven't done it, but I know gardeners that'll do that. At the end of the season with your tomatoes, if it's a hybrid tomato, is you can cut off one of those suckers, root it, bring it indoors, grow it indoors over the winter, and then when you put it back outside in the spring, you've got the exact same type of tomato plant. So it's an interesting idea. Okay, um, let's see what else we have popping up here. It's always good to see so much activity. It's wonderful to see the participation. Um, Luciano is saying this off season is going to be a full dive into prepping my garden area. All garden beds for me. Good for you. Uh, yeah, fall's a, a wonderful prep time. I, I try to build my garden beds in the fall as much as possible so that in the spring I can focus on growing the plants, growing the seeds, doing that kind of thing. So fall's definitely the off season to be um, creating new beds. And this is another area I wanted to talk about when we get into the fall bed development. When you're building new beds, or even when you have older beds in the fall, I think the best time to amend your soil is in the fall. So whether it be a new bed, an old bed, if the soil needs to be amended, I think the fall is the best time to do it. So amending the soil means adding organic material to it. So you're adding an aged manure, you're adding compost, you're adding peat moss, you're adding cocoa core, you're adding leaves, you're adding grass, you're adding those type of materials to your soil. And when I say add, I mean incorporate. You're mixing all of this material into your soil so that it becomes part of your soil. And the reason this is important in um, improving your soil is because all of that organic material becomes food for the microorganisms. The microorganisms break down those organic materials into the nutrients that plant roots need. It's that simple. Well, it takes 
time for that material to be broken down by bacteria, which is extremely small, or the fungi, which is also very small. They take time to break it down. By amending your soil in the fall, you're enriching the food source for these organisms. You're giving them time to break down that food so that when spring comes, the nutrients are there in the soil, ready for the plants to absorb right away. If you amend your soil in spring, which is also good, you run the possibility that the material won't be broken down to the point that the plants can readily use it. So that's the main reason why I think fall amending is better because it just gives nature time to enrich your soil. But it's also, as we talked about in just a few minutes ago, it's an off season. You've got time to build your beds and amend your soil because in many cases, the frost has already come. It's already killed a lot of the plants in those beds. You're pulling them out. You've got bare soil. You need to do something with that soil. So you amend it and then you put a mulch on top because we shouldn't have bare soil going into the winter. You should always mulch your soil going into the winter. So there's some more fall activities to keep you busy. Think about amending your soil. I've got a, that video coming out. I think it's coming out on Sunday. So I'll show you how I amend my beds. I'll be talking a lot more about the organic materials and the soil that way, or in, in that case as well. Uh, Linda's asking, Gardner Scott, I'm looking forward to growing asparagus. What's your favorite variety? Um, so the, the Jersey Knight um, is the variety that I grow and have had the best success with in my area. Uh, in the United States, a lot of the... The, the, the asparagus that you're going to find tends to be a Jersey variety, um, and they're all good. I've had success with all of them. So that's what I would recommend just because that's what I've had success with. But as always, I would say look to your specific region with gardeners in your area to see what they recommend because th th that Jersey Knight does great in my um, zone 5b garden might not be best in your garden so check with other locals to see what they grow but um, I know that that's grown throughout the United States all those different Jersey varieties they've got lots of different names <clears throat> okay let's see Amy is saying Gardner Scott my yard doesn't have an area that I can dig up the native soil what do you look for when you buy topsoil <sighs> Ooh. That's a dangerous area because I don't usually recommend buying topsoil. So when I do, <coughs> here's what I look for. First off, I do not buy bagged topsoil. I don't go to Home Depot. I don't go to Lowe's. I don't buy their bags that are labeled topsoil or garden soil because you don't know what's inside. And I know many of you in this chat have shared this before. When you buy a bagged product, there are no regulations. There are no rules on what it can, can or cannot contain. And so it is not unusual to find big sticks and rusty cans and glass and rocks. I mean, the, I've heard so many horror stories from people who have bought bagged soil. So right off the bat, I do not recommend that at all. But I have gone to my local rock yard or construction um, pro, um, landscape provider. And so most communities have this type of resource. This is where they'll sell gravel and they sell sand and they sell mulch and they sell compost in big piles and they'll often sell topsoil. It's extremely inexpensive. It's the cheapest way to buy soil is to buy it in bulk at one of those locations. And they typically sell it by the yard, cubic yard. You might be able to find it by weight. And so depending on how much you need, I would suggest getting a truck or a trailer and going to a place like that where you can actually get out and physically see what it is 
you're buying. You can put your hand into it. You can see if it's got broken glass and rusty tin cans before you get it. So if you're going to buy topsoil, that's the type of resource that I would recommend because you can check it out and you can ask questions about the source. Do be aware that you don't know where it came from. It could be contaminated with something else, but I've done it. I've bought that type of topsoil. I've accepted the gamble because I've had gardens where I also didn't have enough native soil to put into my beds and I had to get a topsoil and then amend it as well. If that's the case you're going to take, look for at those same type of companies a blend. And that's what I often use where it'll be one third topsoil, one third compost, one third humus or whatever. There's all kinds of different blends. So if you're going to go to the trouble of buying topsoil, I would suggest go to the trouble to buy a soil blend because it'll save you a lot of effort. Okay. Um, Laura Full saying, we've seen a repackaged bag of dirt in Clarence at the grocery store. It looked like they shoveled up the alley dirt behind the store by the creek. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's not what they did. If they had a broken bag and they went out and shoveled something up to fill it. So, um, yeah, definitely something else that you should be concerned about. Um, John Jude says in Columbus, Ohio, compost from our city has many things you don't want in the veggie garden. Good point, Scott. Yeah, I really try to av avoid um, buying um, compost unless I know the source for that reason as well. There's a lot of communities around the world that allow people to bring their material into a public drop-off point, and then the city will compost it, and you can come back and pick up the compost often for free or at very small cost, but you just don't know the source. What if those people were using a lot of herbicides that, that they wanted to clear their land, so the reason they're dropping off all of these dead plants is because they sprayed a bunch of herbicides to kill the plants and then dropped them off at the city source. Now you take that compost and you could be introducing herbicides into your garden, killing everything off. They're just, you have to be really careful, which is why it's so much better if you can learn and figure out how all of us as gardeners to create our own compost, create our own soil and create and a fully enclosed system. We grow our own plants, we use those plants to make compost, we use that compost in soil, and then we grow plants again. A circle where we have complete control over every aspect of the garden. So just be, be forewarned, because as you see in a lot of these comments going back and forth here, a lot of people have had some scary results when they've gotten some of these products that you can buy or pick up for free. <clears throat> okay, um, PD's saying, do you recommend any type of rocks to add to your garden beds, which are void of rocks? In my area of Northern Virginia, just below my soil, there's nothing but rock solid clay. I don't recommend adding rocks, especially in clay. Um, if it's rock solid now, um, think about it like concrete. And one of the ways to make um, Portland cement, which is a lot like clay, become a permanent hard structure is to add rocks to it. That's how you make concrete, by adding rock and sand to Portland cement. So don't add rocks to your clay because essentially you'll be making a type of concrete. Um, and there's really no reason to do it. It doesn't improve drainage. A better way to improve drainage is to add organic material to your soil. So. There isn't a type of rock that I recommend adding to soil or to beds at all. That's the way I garden. Uh, AJ says, any suggestions if you will be gone for months from your garden? Um, yeah, anytime you're going to leave your garden or, as I said a little bit earlier, as we move into winter, treat that time as winter. Cover the soil with mulch so that the soil is protected, the soil organisms can stay alive, keep it work, cut down on the weeds, add the nutrients to the soil as that material breaks down. So anytime I'm going to be away from the garden for a long period of time, um, I would consider covering the soil with mulch as much as possible. If you have good soil, 
um, soil you know that is rich, I would try to enlist the help of someone to water your beds. Even if there's no plants growing in those beds, you want to keep your soil alive. So I water my soil through the winter just to keep it moist, to keep those organisms alive. If you're going to be gone for a while, I'm guessing any plants you have in your landscape, you either, ha you either have set up on a timer or you have someone else coming in to water those plants, definitely take that into account if you're going to be gone for a while. But think about the whole system. It's more than just the plants. It's also the soil so that when you come back, you don't have weeds everywhere because you didn't mulch and the weeds are going to pop up in every spot of bare soil that you have. Uh, but enlist help from um, neighbor kids or anyone else you might have access to to keep areas mowed, to keep areas um, picked up and clean, to keep an eye on things, and also to water the soil and plants as needed. Okay, um, still have lots of stuff. Look, Chana says, if you add the Home Depot sand and have clay soil, you will basically have cement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Laurelful says, if you've made soil cement by accident, remember the formula for when you're setting in posts when building a fence. Um, yeah, that's a little humorous, but absolutely. You can recover from that. If you add sand to clay or add rocks to clay or add um, sand and rocks to clay or just rocks to other soil, you can recover, but it takes a long time. And the fix is usually organic material, just adding organic material until the soil recovers, pulling out the rocks every opportunity that you can, keeping the soil as loose and freeable as possible. So uh, yeah, just avoid all that in the first place. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about ground covers today. And this actually kind of plays into your question about what to do if you're going to be gone for a long period of time. Ground covers may be the option. Now you can put a mulch down and then put a ground cover on top of the mulch. And so a ground cover uh, or a green manure, if you're doing it for the purpose of improving your soil, is a way to cover up your soil, usually going into the winter. And I have a video on this. There's lots of information out there. But the idea is that you cover your soil and it's just as good to cover your soil with a plant as it is to cover your soil with a mulch. You're protecting that top layer of soil from the irradiation from the sun during the winter. You're protecting it from weeds that could potentially grow and you're allowing that cover to help prevent some of the soil evaporation and also moderate some of the soil temperatures. So ground covers are also great at this time of year to try to get some of them started, get some of those seeds. You can buy bulk ground covers. And, and a lot of these are plants you're familiar with. Clover is a great ground cover. Now, most of us don't like clover growing in our lawn, but in a garden bed, clover's great. It'll actually add some nitrogen to the soil. And almost all of these cover crops that you start growing in the fall, they're in place in the winter. In the spring, you just mow them down or you pull them up and add them to your compost pile. And again, it's that circle where you're growing plants with the intention of improving your soil. Ground covers. If you haven't thought about it, it's another early fall activity. I've already been collecting vetch seed from the vetch that I've been growing. And I've started seeding vetch all over my garden. Um, very durable plant. It grows into the winter. Depending on how bad the winter is, it'll even grow through the winter. And in the spring, then I'll start dealing with the vetch plants, either pulling them up and adding them to the compost or allowing some of them to flower because they'll flower relatively early, long before many of the flowers in our landscape. And they're an early food for bees. So start looking into some cover crop options moving into the fall as well, along with the mulch to help protect your soil. Um, Denver 1865 says, I plant ground cover over using mulches every time I can. Try to fill in areas with the plants I love. There you go. 
Um, and, and he lives just up the road from me. So we have a pretty harsh winter environment and ground covers, even in our harsh mountain region, do extremely well to protect the soil. So definitely think about it. Um, Sherazad says, can you cover your bed with cardboard over the winter? Sure. Yeah. Um, if you have a choice of nothing or cardboard, I would choose cardboard. Now, the issue with cardboard is it's not much different than plastic when it comes to covering your bed. It's a barrier. It will keep water out. It will keep air out. Um, and particularly in the winter, you want water and air getting into your soil. So, yes, you can cover with cardboard. I would say, I would definitely say mulch is a much better option uh, as to covering your beds. But between nothing and cardboard, I would say cardboard. You're going to have to weight the cardboard down with something so that it's not blowing away. You can put cardboard and then cover that with mulch as, as an option. So um, Linda Hardwick is saying, did you say cover crop after your fall mulch? I did. It depends on the type of cover crop. So like vetch, for instance, um, vetch will grow through the mulch. So I can put uh, vetch seeds underneath the mulch and they'll pop right up through. Um, there are a lot of um, like winter rye that you can do that with. I did that last year where I planted winter rye or I put the seeds in place and then put a mulch on top of it and it grew up through the mulch. So it depends on the type of plant and it depends on how thick the mulch is, but I'll use both. Yeah, I'll use um, a mulch and then a plant that grows through and then on top of that mulch um, just as protection for the entire area. And then it gives me organic material to use in my compost pile. Um, and the reason I do that, and I think this is why you're probably asking the question, is because in my area with a fall at who knows when we're going to get a fall, snow or freezing temperature, it's just so erratic that I don't necessarily have enough time for a cover crop to fill in the space that I'm trying to cover. I just, I just can't be assured of that in my region with my weather. So I'll have a mulch to help protect the soil and then I'll have a cover crop in addition to the mulch just to ensure that the soil is completely protected going into the winter. If you've got a longer fall, a more sustained, gradual period before winter comes, then you can probably get by with just cover crops, absolutely. And they'll be able to fill in a space without a need for mulch at all. There's also a consideration if you're doing a cover crop in a region like that where you've got enough time for the plant to grow into the winter and then the winter will kill that plant. Um, there are like some Austrian peas, for instance, are cover crops that are often used, but the winter will kill it. Well, you can grow your cover crop and then after the plant dies, go ahead and put a mulch on top of that. And that's just a way to add more organic material into the soil. So use both of those as you go into the fall. Sharon C., good to see you again this week. Thank you for that thumbs up and that contribution chat as well. Thank you so much. Um, always good to see you here. Steve Bach is saying straw for mulch. Yep. I, I use straw for mulch. There's some concern these, get, these days in the United States because um, there are some sources of straw that may have been treated with herbicide. They should report that. If you ask your straw um, source at the store, they might know. Often they don't, but that's a question to ask. But yes, I use straw all the time. I'm trying to get to the point where I'm using less straw and more leaves because leaves rarely have that issue where someone has sprayed herbicide on the leaves. Um, but I, I use a lot of straw mulch, absolutely. <clears throat> Deborah White is asking, is moss a cover crop? In most areas, it's not. If you live in a really moist environment with moderate winter temperatures, then then I am aware of people that have used moss as a cover crop. So a lot of it depends on where you're living, where you're gardening, your weather, your climate, and you might be able to use moss. The idea is just a plant, a plant that will cover your soil 
and protect it from the sun. So lots of different options out there. I mentioned some of them in my video about green manures and cover crops, and there's lots of other information out there. Okay, uh, let's get to that point in the show where we start talking about how I garden, why I garden, my philosophy of gardening. And this ties in a little bit as well with uh, a discovery moment that I had this week. I saw the, the film, the documentary, The Biggest Little Farm. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. If you have seen it, go ahead and let me know in the comments. Just say yes or yes, you've seen it or what you thought about it. Uh, I, I suspect some of you have seen it. The Biggest Little Farm came out a little over a year ago. It's a great film. It's, it's a story of a man, a woman, and a dog and how they create a farm in Southern California, Southern California and the issues they have with this farm as they're creating a diverse environment within their farm. And that's what I want to talk about today is diversity. If you've seen a lot of my videos and stuck with me in these live chats over the many weeks, I often talk about diversity as a solution to plant problems in one way or another. So if someone asks a question about a pest in their garden, I often say the answer is to try to bring in beneficial insects. If you have other insect issues, I might suggest trying to bring in birds in your garden. I'm trying to add diversity to my garden with the insects, with the birds, with the soil microorganisms, with the plants. Everything should add to your garden. And one of the ways to improve your environment within your garden is with diversity. Now, this film, The Biggest Little Farm, talks about it on an extremely large scale operation with dozens if not hundreds of different varieties of plants and trees and then bringing in the animals to make it even more diverse both animals that they bring in that are domesticated but also the wild animals that all begin to work together and the film is an eight-year journey showing how they reach that point i call it equilibrium that's what i've called it in some of my earlier videos but it's it's the point where nature essentially is taking care of your garden for you the garden problems you have are no longer garden problems because nature has reached a point of equilibrium where you can sit back and just enjoy the process you you often need to continue to manage the environment and feed the environment but nature does all the hard work. I, I saw this at the Galileo Garden, the school garden that I managed a few years back. At the four-year point, that's when we began to reach an equilibrium level where the amount of effort dealing with pests, particularly insect pests, was greatly reduced. In the third year, we had an infestation of aphids, an infestation of harlequin bugs, an infestation of squash bugs. We had good harvest, but we just had a lot of harmful bugs. In the fourth year, none of that. A few aphids, but no harlequin bugs really to speak of, no potato beetles, no squash bugs. It was just one of those things where the garden began taking care of itself and the the way I reached that point in four years was by planting grasses and flowers and shrubs and trees a lot more than just a vegetable garden so as you move forward with this fall planning and looking to next year start thinking about how you can increase the diversity within your garden space and anything that you can add increases the diversity if you add one new type of flower you've made your garden better if you add a tree 
you've made your garden better. All of those different types of plants will play a role to achieve the equilibrium. And don't question yourself too much. Don't think about it too hard. If you've got an open space in your garden and you're thinking, wow, should I put in an ornamental grass or should I put in a perennial flower? My suggestion is do both. Put in that grass and put in that flower. They both will provide benefits to your garden. And if you look at another spot that you just don't know what to do with, maybe at some point in the future you'll put a raised bed, maybe you'll put an in-ground bed, maybe you'll put a water fountain. You just don't know what you're going to do to that space. Well, do something to it. Just put some plants in it right now, this fall, even some seeds. I had that video last week where I talked about native plants and perennial plants. Fall is a really good time to sow a lot of those seeds. So if you have a space you just don't know what to do with, just go ahead and put some seeds in place. Mulch it a little bit and then let nature take over. It's all about increasing the diversity within your space. If you have a particular pest problem, you can probably find out what type of insect or animal will deal with that pest and often it comes down to a recommendation of a type of plant because the beneficial insect needs a grass to overwinter or that beneficial animal needs a tree to roost in those are the kind of things i'm talking about and that's one reason why i say i have a five-year plan in my garden because as I saw at the Galileo Garden, it takes at least four years to see noticeable results. And based on my own experience, it's the five-year point when you can really enjoy your garden because a lot of that hard work dealing with the problems is lessened to the point that now you got to find something to do with your time. Well, might as well just sit in your garden and enjoy a nice cup of tea, eh? Think about that kind of stuff as well. So diversity is so key to reaching that vision that many of us have about our gardens. And right now your vision may be just about having the best vegetable garden possible. Well, expand your vision a little bit because to get that best vegetable garden, it probably should include some beautiful flowers that are growing around those vegetable beds. It should probably include some really nice landscape grasses along the paths that you take to get to your vegetable garden. It probably includes some type of water feature, even a little solar fountain like the project I did last month to attract some of those things to your garden and also give you the sound of water, which is so comforting in the garden. This is all the kind of stuff that you should start thinking about as you move into your planning process and creating the vision for your garden for next year and the year after and the year after. For me, it's a five year plan. Now, don't think that I'm done at five years. It's just gonna take me five years to reach that point because it doesn't happen overnight. It takes work, takes effort, takes planning. It takes a little bit of creativity, but it's often as simple as just buying a package of flower seeds and throwing them on a bare spot of soil. And then the diversity is increased. So think about looking at, uh, for that movie, The Biggest Little Farm. I really enjoyed it. It really helped me feel better about how I garden. I know the way I garden is, a, is an effective way, and I like doing it. But to see it on a much grander scale, where you can really see how nature works to correct the problems that nature has created, it, it's fascinating. And it took them eight years to effectively reach equilibrium. But when they did, it's such a heartwarming story that I have to recommend it to you. And it might open your eyes a little bit more about the concept of diversity within your garden. Not just the plants, not just the insects, not just the animals. It's everything that you should think about when it comes to gardening, creating your vision, 
and getting to the point that you can just really, really enjoy what you're doing. So there's some ideas. Um, the name of the movie, again, is The Biggest Little Farm. And it came out, I think officially it came out in 2019. So it, it's not that old. Um, it's available streaming. Uh, I still am old school Netflix DVD, so I actually got it on a Netflix DVD. Um, but there are some of the streaming services out there that you can stream it um, for whatever the cost of your streaming service is. Uh, you can also buy it. And I'm thinking about buying it just because it's one of those things I think I, I need to share with my family and other gardeners when I have the opportunity. So The Biggest Little Farm, it's all about diversity. I'm all about diversity. You've heard me talk about that before. I just think it's awesome that there's this, this incredible documentary that says the same thing. Um, so there you go. So cool. Uh, Luciano says that um, the California as well. So um, I don't know if they give tours. Uh, they do give tours. They end the movie with some tours of the farm. Um, so if you are in Southern California, um, I think it's called um, Apricot Lane Farms. Um, you'd have to look that up for sure. But they talk about it in the movie, and I think they give tours. I'd love to go down there and get a tour of that. So something definitely to think about. MH, thank you for that contribution. Thumbs up before you go. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Um, let's see anything else that we have popping up. John Ann is saying, love multi-planted beds instead of single species beds. They feed and protect themselves. Good point. And I didn't say that. I, I show that in my videos and I talk about it in my videos. I didn't say it right now. Excellent point, John Ann. Thank you for sharing that. When you get to diversity, it's not just growing a lot of different things, but having separate different things that you're growing put everything together. In, in, in my beds, I did not have a bed that had a single plant growing in that bed this year. I've done that before, didn't do it this year. Even in my garlic bed, because I typically only grow garlic in a bed, even in my garlic bed, I grew peas on one end of the bed. Some of the other beds, I grew as many as 12 different types of plants at the same time in my bed. And I'm talking vegetable plants in my vegetable beds. So diversity holds true, not just at large scale, but also side by side next to each other within your garden. You can have all kinds of different types of plants. The diversity is there from one inch to another within your garden. And it it makes the whole thing better. So thank you, John Ann. I appreciate you bringing that up because that's an excellent point. Diversity from the macro level as you look at your garden as a whole, and then diversity within the bed as, as you look at what you're growing within a smaller space. And I would even bring it down to diversity side by side, inch by inch within your garden. So from a micro view to a macro view, have a diverse garden, have a diverse biosystem, you will have far better results with all of your plants and you will enjoy the whole thing. Well, there we are. It's the end of our time. Always the the worst part of the live stream for me on Monday is when we reach the end. I want to thank you all so much for being here today, for sharing this time, for asking your questions, for sharing your information, for being part of the Gardner Scott community. This is so wonderful. I hope as we enter the first day of fall, the first day of autumn tomorrow, that you have a wonderful growing season still left ahead of you and that the next period of your garden hopefully is as wonderful as this last period has been. I thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you again next Monday. And until we reach that point, I'm Gardner Scott. Enjoy gardening.